It's quite interesting that today we celebrate a golden wedding anniversary. But on the same day that Steve has asked me to do this next part of the Sermon on the Mount that we've just heard, which for most of us, it's a concentration on anger, really. So from joyful thanksgiving to anger. Of course, this scripture starts with Jesus telling us he knows we know. We know the law. We know what we should be doing. And interesting that actually he picks on murder and says we know that murder is wrong and then we'll be judged about that. And of course, most murders happen in the home in family relationships between husband and wife, between siblings, children and parents. And yet we know our scriptures and scripture talks of the relationship of God in Jesus with us as two like a marriage, like bride and groom. Now most murders start when a situation causes anger in another. And I might ask you all, have you ever really been angry with someone? Don't put your hands up. <laughs> Chesterfield will think we've gone charismatic. But perhaps you were so angry with someone that you actually lost your temper, lost control, and maybe even verbally said something, oh, I could kill you, harm them but were restrained perhaps by knowing the punishment that awaited you. But inside the anger still remained, eating away at you, affecting the relationship. But then you catch yourself as a Christian and you realize that Jesus told us that anger itself is also a sin, to be judged. Well, he didn't say that anger was a sin. He was said, told us that how we allowed anger to be used in us could be a sin. But believe me, it really does, talking personally, take a saint who could not be driven to uncontrolled anger. Especially when the threat or the action is aimed at one of your own family or a despicable act upon a person or society. And God knows that. When, like me, you're called to the remains of a small child who's been assaulted and left dead to be fed on by foxes and rats at the edge of a farmer's field. Or you've come face to face with a man who assaulted your own wife getting off the bus one dog night. And I could go on, and perhaps that's why Steve asked me to do this week in this series. He knows just how angry I have been at times during my life, or how many times I have had to deal with other people's anger, and still perhaps could easily be an angry old man the way the world is. But perhaps you could too. <coughs> But I, like you, know the law. I know the Ten Commandments. You shouldn't commit murder, kill anyone out of uncontrolled anger. However, Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount is, as always, pushing us beyond the law, the law of Moses, beyond the law itself. God, anger is a God-given emotion, part of all those emotions that he gave us to be used positively. And he challenges us not only on the sinfulness of murder, but also on the sinful misuse of that anger itself. Jesus has just finished telling us in verses 17 to 20 that we must live an ultra-righteous life in order to get into the kingdom of heaven, which points us to our great need to know him in Jesus, 
know him in Jesus's, Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life for righteousness' sake. Know him for his kingdom here on earth, of which we are part. Jesus is beginning a series of statements that follow that very format. You have heard it said, but now I say to you, you need to take it a bit further. Jesus, in these statements, is acknowledging the teaching of the Jewish law on a matter, and then he's adding to that commandment or clarifying it or explaining what was, what was really at the heart of it by adding two more standards, the very two commandments that he himself gave us, to do everything in love. Yes, get angry in love. Jesus is not doing away with the law. He wants it fulfilled in him, in himself. It's explaining it to his followers to fulfill in their lives, in our lives. Anger, this God-given emotion, given for godly purpose. However, like all godly gifts, the devil can get in on them. And it has a destructive side. A decide that can hurt people and hinder not only our relationship with each other, but also with God. Jesus gives the grace to deal with what lies beneath, <clears throat> that often gets in the way of ours being his to others. <clears throat> I wonder if you uh, you've been following recent events. Um, well. You may have heard a story. Forgive me a moment. <coughs> the French get everywhere. Sorry. That was a joke. But did you hear the story about young Prince George? Who at his new school got angry with his classmates' jibes at him. And he turned around to them and said, My dad's going to be the king. So you'd better watch out. <laughs> I think it's something, and perhaps we've all said in one way or the time, my dad's bigger than your dad. My big brother will get hold of you. In our case, of course, it was my big sister who will look after you, but there you go. Nowadays, I suspect parents are soon sending a message to the teacher, angrily complaining about such behaviour. In this case, of course, it is the anti-monarchy brigade that's got online and using this quote to bring up the anger of people against the monarchy. But anger is a God-given emotion that grabs us physically and moves us immediately towards a counter-activity to the threat from those who interfere with or threaten us. And that's why I hope Put a D in front of anger, danger. Anger can be evil. And in those verses 21 to 22, when the devil gets at it, it can be disastrous. Actually, you told me a story, didn't you? About when you were at the post office and you heard a noise below and you were looking out through the window and there's uh, this man with this woman and he's going, you know I love you. <laughs> well, yes. That is not the love we're talking about this morning. You've heard what it was said, do not murder. I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus is taking mere observance of the law further. As Christians, he wants us to be more than just compliant. Then he says, whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. Hellfire. Who here hasn't called somebody a fool or something like that? This term hellfire is from that word Gehenna, 
which actually refers to a trash dump outside of Jerusalem. One of those trash dumps that's always burning. And Jesus is saying that the judgment that we could experience if we give ourselves up to anger in the wrong way, that insults others, could be like that continual fire burning up, not only in us, but in those two that we've insulted, causing a great stink, if you like, causing more problems. And it usually does. We get angry, somebody else gets angry, then somebody else gets angry, and before you know, you've got a large problem on your hands. Just as murder is sinful because it's a physical violation of someone else, so verbally insulting someone is a sin. Verbally insulting someone who's also created in the image of God. And it doesn't mean just in this day and age, face to face. It's the misuse of uh, all the media that we have, all this social media, where we can immediately react by putting something on, anonymously even, or using some quote to get at somebody else, instead of using your anger positively to turn around the wrong. Just as murder is sinful, physical violation, so is the anger inside. But he's not saying that murder and anger are the same. Let's be clear. He says that both are worthy of judgment. So our judgment may not be here on earth. It may well be preventing us going home to the Father. Jesus' anger, of course, we know. We know he got ha angry. And we might say that it was righteous anger. But none of us are Jesus, are we? I look around just in case any of us are claiming. So we're not perfect. So we should be very careful to claim that any of our own outbursts of anger is righteous anger either. Jesus' anger was an identification of the sin of others towards God and us. And then out of a loving heart, seeking reconciliation of the injury caused by such anger, even to the cross for our sins. A seeking of restoration of relationship between us and God, let alone between us and each other. Our anger, and I include myself here, can open the door and allow the devil full range. And don't we know it? Secondly, verses 23 to 24, anger can be reconciled. Jesus tells us to reconcile any issue we have with brother or sister. There's an old saying, isn't there? Never go to bed on an argument. Yes, and it's true. Never go to bed angry. For one thing, you'll never sleep. For the other thing, it'll just eat you up. And the other person probably too. There is hope and even an expectation that anger can be reconciled between us. And it's a hope, it's a truth that he's given us in Jesus. How, oh wow, how this world needs to know that. And how and why Jesus called us to be the salt and light to the world. Jesus believes, shows us so highly that reconciliation is necessary. And that's why we have in some places of Christian worship, even happening this morning, the act of sharing the grace. And that's not just the words, that's physically as well. 
That's why they do come together, hold each other, and share the grace to remove any obstacle of relationship between them and between them and God. Now just think about the implications of that. God is worthy of worship more than anyone else in the universe, yet we are to put that on hold in order to resolve anger with another human being. Stop your worship and do it. Make things right between you, and then you'll be right to worship. Don't come with anger on your heart. Sort it. Worship. Of course, when Jesus says, your brother and sister, he doesn't just mean, literally, your brother or sister. He means all your brothers and sisters, all those that he has created. If we have anger, or if we are aware of someone having anger towards us, He's saying, fix it. Use your anger positively by using it in love. A costly, sacrificial, loving act of reconciliation. I was sitting down with a lady this week who's in a family of anger at this moment of time. I know it's pulling her apart. Her children angry at each other and therefore angry at her. It needs resolution. I would not want to go to my deathbed in a family of anger. God doesn't want us to die in anger either. Sort it, he's saying. And that's what he's saying to our whole world. Sort it. And that's why he's saying it to us. The ones who live in his name, in his way, in his truth. Whatever is in your life, sort it. Oh, what a world we'd live in if they'd just get it sorted. Oh, what a kingdom of God we'd live in. Oh, not possible. Are you saying to me this morning, well, yes, but I, I can't. It's all right for you, Ken. You're old, you're retired. No problem, just, you know, keep out of trouble. Retire gracefully. I can't. I get angry with the world. You know, I sometimes get angry with some of you lot. But I try to sort it, get it right. Be reconciled. Because then it goes on to say, Otherwise, it has consequences. If we refuse to take the path of reconciliation, then we assume full responsibility for the debt. However, our debt is too great, I know, for us to repay. Jesus told a story about a man who owed the king what might have been the equivalent of millions of quid these days. He begged the king to have mercy on him, and the king did. In fact, he forgave the entire debt. But not long after that, this man met somebody who owed him 100 quid, and he grabbed him, and he had him thrown into debtor's jail until he paid up. The man begged for mercy, but received none. And when the king heard about it, he wasn't happy. He ordered the unmerciful man to be thrown into prison until he paid up all that was owed. 
which was never going to happen. We can never, I know, pay for our own sins. And that is why the punishment for rejecting God's grace is eternal. An eternity of suffering will never atone for our offenses against God. The last penny will never be paid for those who refuse to settle their offenses against God. However, for those who ask for mercy and who are willing to face their offenses against God and man, their debt is paid in full. So to conclude, Jesus continues to teach those on the mount, us indeed, whom he has already been ministering to, already has healed of their sicknesses and brought us into being his kingdom people here on earth, has revealed to us how blessed we are, even though life might have been unpleasant at times shown us the value he actually places on us by calling us the very salt of the earth, the very light to the world. Now he shows us what kind of beautiful attitudes we are to have towards each other because it is the way, it is the truth, and it is the life that we not only know in him, but we should be living for him. It's not enough to think that we're okay, we come to church, we keep the law, whilst we still hold anger in our hearts. Perhaps let it still consume us up. We're out of tune with each other, with the world, and with the kingdom of God here on earth. Peacemakers are called sons and daughters of God, so they have everything they need to overcome the wrong thinking of this world. Not counting the cost. In Titus 2 it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has already appeared to all men. Jesus teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And instead, in all our relationships, to love. To love the Lord our God and to love each other. To love the Lord our God with all heart, mind, everything. And love each other as we know we've been loved. Here today, as we have celebrated 50 years of marriage of pure love that overcomes the obstacles putting its way to keep the covenant commitment made to each other before God. I can't help but be reminded once more of that biblical picture we're given of Jesus and us, his church. Jesus as bride and groom with us. His people, the bride. He's gone to prepare a place for us, we're told. Are we prepared and ready to overcome the obstacles the devil seeks to put on us to join him there? Nurture your kingdom heart. Put off anger and malice. Let your anger become positive rather than negative, constructive instead of destructive. Let your light shine. Let your love overcome the devil and his ways. Oh, Jesus, thou art all compassion. Pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation. Enter each and every trembling heart.